I'm very passionate about the power of data and what we can do with those things, but at the same time, this is meant to be fun and engaging. So if I can make you giggle at me, that's fine. With me is even better. Uh, but what I want to talk about today are all of the experiences that maybe have led me to realize that marketing has to fundamentally change the way we're thinking about what it is that we're responsible for. So a few years ago, when Mark Andreessen first said that software is eating the world, my immediate next thought was, probably true, but SaaS is drinking all of the fresh water. And if that's the case, then what is it that we have to do differently? Because as a marketer, I'm having more and more expectations placed upon me inside of the executive suite, inside of the boardroom, to deliver results. And yet at the same time, the traditional means that were, the traditional means at my disposal of emails and so forth are less effective than they ever have been, thanks to time shifting and all of those aspects that are out there. So with that challenge ahead of us, what is it that we really have to do differently? And my answer to that is, you've got to get sassy with your marketing. I do that mostly so my team can make fun of me for saying the word sassy as much as possible. But I mean really finding creatively analytic ways to grow, not thinking about marketing in the terms that we have forever. So I've been thinking about this idea of how you really implement data for about a decade. I've done some stuff since the moment I, I joined Skype to start wondering what could you do with billions and billions of pieces of data in order to make marketing more effective? And I tell you this not because I think you should take what I say, carte blanche, and go implement it. In fact, I tell you this because I believe that taking somebody else's plan and implementing it for yourself is almost a guaranteed way to get a B minus answer or a B minus outcome. So instead, I kind of hope you'll do what my kids do or what I tell my kids to do. Hear me out before you decide whether or not to listen to me because I may be absolutely dead wrong about what I'm about to say. Everybody has to find for themselves what is the value that you guys can find in the data that you and the ways that you think about marketing. So before you have to listen to me, I'd love to hear from you a little bit. So in this time of global SaaS, where, as Jeff was saying, I face a challenge that we have 200 million users in every UN-recognized country around the globe, and a marketing budget that if I spent it all in San Francisco, I probably couldn't change the numbers inside of San Francisco. In that context, what is it that I should really be thinking about the most? Is it A, storytelling, what we've been told as marketers was our competence from the beginning? Is it B, channel optimization? C, timing? Or D, should I just give up and keep having martini lunches with any agency that'll take me out? So if you just text whatever your vote is to the 22333 number. All right, real-time digital data. I don't know that this is going into our Telium instance, but I suspect it is. Okay, so let's spend a minute as it sort of quiets down and start talking about what each of these would imply if that was what our focus really was. Right? So if we click back to the slides for a second, let's talk about storytelling, right? Because a great story is always emotional. And as marketers, we've been told from the very beginning that this is what we are most responsible for. And I think I can tell you compellingly that a great story truly is going to create a connection with your users, if told correctly, simply by showing you a video that has a decent chance to elicit tears from me while we're up here. And it's an ad for possibly the most static technology out there in a web browser. Are you ready for your big party today? <laughs>
So if you're about to be a brand new father and you see that ad, there's absolutely no way I think you make it through that without breaking down a little bit. But the problem with that is not everybody's about to be a new dad, right? So how do you make that story compelling for every single person? How do you tell everyone the story that is going to touch them as much as that touched me? Then the second problem with that is, I think the first time I saw that ad, I was watching Sunday football with my fantasy league, and that's a pretty bad time to break down crying in front of a bunch of guys from Ohio. <laughs> so I'm not sure that it exactly elicited the exact uh, reaction that everybody was hoping for. But unequivocally, storytelling will always, always be at the heart of what we're trying to do. It's just that the nature of matching that story to the audience and the moment is becoming more important than it ever has been before. So about 20, I think, 3% of us voted that the key is finding the right channel that's out there, that we can actually go talk to our users. So the market, American Marketing Association is telling us that people get about 10,000 different brand images implanted in the brain about every day at this point. So if you can't find a channel that lets you break through that noise, I think it's unequivocal that it's probably going to be hard to reach people as we go through those things. But at the same time, all of the traditional channels that are out there and available to us are becoming less and less effective than they ever have been before. If you just look at click-through rates on each of the different things that we all think of as what we're trying to optimize, what we're trying to milk that last 10 basis points of conversion out of, you can think about email being the most predominant one that's just getting crushed, right? Click-through rates on email are down almost 50% just in the last seven years. And that's still way better than what you see out of search or display banners. So you actually have a better chance in your life of surviving a plane crash than you do clicking on a banner ad. That's a kind of amazing stat to think about how much time we spend trying to optimize those banner ads. So then about 22% of us voted that moments are really magic. So that's less, only about one out of five thought that this is the thing that we should be thinking about the most. But if you can really find that moment to talk to somebody, could that be as powerful as you think it, it, as, it, as any of the other levers at our disposal? So who's been on an airplane, and all of a sudden, either you or somebody next to you is suddenly just crying uncontrollably for what seems like no apparent reason, right? So this happens to me a disturbing amount of time, and I'm realizing I'm quite a crier as I was preparing for today. Uh, and it happens when I'm watching some god-awful pop culture movie like Miss Congeniality or something that you've seen like 100 times on TBS. And I always sat there puzzled by this. And then recently, psychologists started studying that. And they found out that 55% of us experience a heightened emotional state when we're flying. And no one has any idea why. Is it physiological because of air pressure? Is it something psychological because you're rocketing through the air at 600 miles an hour in a death tube with a bunch of strangers and this could be the last minute? Like, no one knows. But if miscongeniality can pull at your heartstrings a little bit, imagine if we could match that chromad with that moment in, in the airplane. I'd probably never be able to get up again. I might get, I'd be on the TSA watch list as the crier before that was all over. But we've actually researched the heck out of these three levers and trying to figure out what it is as growth marketers, growth hackers, we really need to be thinking about most. And interestingly, as much as everyone has always answered that question as storytelling is the primary thing that marketers are responsible for, talking to someone at the right moment is twice as important as reaching them through the right channel, which is twice as important as saying the right words to them. Ask me, ask Airbnb, ask any of the guys who are responsible for growth hacking in a global SaaS business, and we worry way, way more about that exact moment. The first time I realized this was when we were at Skype, facing all of the monetization issues that come with any freemium model. So Skype had this challenge that only 61% of our installed base even knew how Skype made money from international long distance calling. We were also not a regulated telco, so I couldn't t use the words phone call in marketing. Those are two pretty big constraints out there in order to try to make money, right? So we started looking at the data, and the data told us the first most important thing, which is what you see in those curves on the left. That if these are adoption curves of different features based on the time since somebody starts using Skype. So if you don't find a way to introduce people to different features in the first, say, week of their time with you as a SaaS product, you're basically never going to change their conception of what you are. And for Skype, that meant we would be video calling grandma forever. And we would never be what WhatsApp was as far as chunkable communication in an SMS platform. 
but I don't have any way to tell people about this. We literally email bombarded them for two years of just saying, buy more international long distance calling, please. Oh God, please buy it. I said buy it. And then it dawned on us that if we have to reach you that way, what is the moment that we should reach you? It's in those first three days. It's in the product. So we just simply floated this dial pad right here. Does everybody know what that is without even needing words around it, right? It's just a dial pad to call a phone, just like we've all seen since the, you know, the 50s. And then we put a dollar in there so you could make your first phone call for free. All of a sudden, you could add 11% to the expected value of a user on the day that they joined us. That's like creating $110 million of value in the course of four hours of coding and four days of testing and zero dollars of marketing. What I don't know is whether or not that is a marketing idea or a product idea at this point, but I didn't really care because it was a good idea and it made us a lot of money. So that was the first time that we figured out what it meant to really get it right. And that was the first time that it sort of con I started to conceive of this idea that there was a, um, the possibility of describing marketing in this sassy way. And I think if many of you are probably sitting there saying, this is exactly what marketing has always been. It's the right message at the right time. How, how hard is that to figure out? And I'd say certainly at the highest level, that's probably very, very true, right? But the way that you go about implementing those things in a SaaS-based world is very different because it relies on, number one, the personalization of that experience for somebody. So that you're not trying to tell them the story that you want to tell them. You're telling them the story that they will want to hear and that they will react to. And then the second thing is, you're figuring out the right time to tell them that story. Because time is no longer things like 10 a.m. on Sunday, right? Time is incredibly relative the way we consume content now. Because I can decide when I consume the content that's being delivered to me through time shifting, through the different channels that people are reaching me. So certainly, we still want to deliver the right message at the right time. But how we go about that isn't going to be the same. And when you bring those two things together, that's the moment that you can marry creativity and analytics in order to produce the outcomes that you're really, really looking for. And that's what I think we have to do in order to be successful. So let me talk a little bit about how we do that at Evernote specifically and how we've used that to get to those outcomes that we're looking at. So first, anybody have an Evernote account in here? Awesome. Looked like a little bit more than half of you. So if you are, live in the US and make more than $100,000 as an individual, there's a 50-50 chance that you have an Evernote account at this time. So Evernote was like the first of the digital productivity tools to emerge with this uh, vision that we could possibly build software that was an extension of the human brain that let you capture any idea regardless of its format and have it available to you on any platform forever. It's a pretty cool idea. And it skyrocketed us to the beginning of really the unicorn phase. In 2011, Evernote was named Inc. Company of the Year. And then unfortunately, four years later, we were pronounced as the first dead unicorn. I always want to thank this guy who has the best name ever for a snarky journalist, Josh Dixon, for uh, calling us, pointing that out to us, because this happened about 30 days before I joined Evernote. So, Part of me said, hey, maybe Josh has a point, right? Like, at that point where I signed up, we were burning $5 million of cash a month. We were trying to monetize by selling you socks. And we weren't even really thinking about marketing in the way that we could have with all of the data that we, that we are the home for. So spoiler alert, right? 18 months later now, we're not dead. We just passed 200 million users. We're now the home to more than 5 billion notes of unstructured data. People spend almost 600, more than 600 million hours in our app, and we've doubled the number of paying users that are out there. So maybe the most impressive number in all of that for the marketing group is, this is how much we spend per user to market. We've done all of this just simply by thinking about how could we use the data that's at our disposal and ask some really intelligent questions in order to create moments where people actually want to pay us. So that was sort of the first question that we asked, was what causes someone to pay you in a SaaS-based world. So this is all publicly available information that you can get through S1s or the SEC. And what it shows you is that the percentage of registered users who are actually active in any SaaS company pretty much always caps out at about 25. The percentage of active users who pay you moves rather drastically. And then the size of those bubbles is based on how much they pay you. Obviously, Box has a little bit of a different experience because of being an enterprise-based offering. 
and I can't tell you where Evernote ranks on these things, but say when we started benchmarking things, we realized that the goal was probably not about selling, even though our objective was to deliver revenue. So what is it that we were going to start thinking about that actually caused somebody to uh, convert into a paying user for us? Because ch chasing that conversion is almost a guaranteed way not to catch it. But in actuality, if you just think about what causes somebody to value Evernote and lead them to find that value, then they end up paying you. The correlation between engaging and paying is something like 0.82 in the SaaS world. So the idea that you're trying to f cause people to give you money as opposed to helping them find the value in Evernote is completely erroneous, right? And instead, when you started to look at, this is just a, a max diff analysis based on free users and paying users and the various aspects of Evernote that they would value. And the most interesting thing is, what caused people to find value was exactly the same for a free user and a paying user. So it had no relationship whatsoever to whether or not you paid us which is sort of a fascinating thing because number one, we weren't taking advantage of the value we were creating. And number two, you had a group of people who were paying you for something that wasn't the most valuable thing for them. So we started to ask ourselves, well, how can we ask for this value exchange for what it is that we do better than anybody else, which is making your data available to you anywhere? There are lots of ways that you could go about this, but the crux of it turned out to be, let's just introduce the idea that you have to pay us if you want your data to truly be available on any platform out there. So a two-device paywall. Pretty simple concept, does what Dropbox has always been trying to, has always done so well, which is say, if you like that first taste of what you got, then pay us to get some more, right? Did you like the first gig of data? Here's a terabyte, but you pay us. Did you like the first few devices of Evernote? Get the third one um, by paying us. And all of a sudden, by introducing that, we were able to not only double the number of paying users, but actually also see our, our, um, the ASP of all of that increase along the way as well, ultimately leading us to this moment where we're now cash flow positive and can be out there investing in our product again without ever having to bombard people in such a way that we force them to pay us. It wasn't just about changing the offer though, right? Like that's a really interesting pricing discussion. Because when we first introduced it, it had an impact, but it didn't have the size of the impact that necessarily we were hoping for. And instead, we had to go back to the questions that we started with of, are we telling the story correctly? Did we find people in the right channel? And are we telling them at the right time? So let's start by talking about how we figured out what the right moment was. So it might seem pretty intuitive, right, that the right moment to tell somebody that there's a two-device paywall is when they add, want to add the third device, right? Well, that's a pretty stark moment for a lot of people, right? Because all of a sudden you're saying, hey, you can no longer access this content that's probably very personal and very important to your life right now unless you pay us. You're almost holding it hostage. And that's not the intent at all of what we were trying to do. And instead, all we wanted to do was make them, a, excuse me, was make them aware that this is the point where we ask you to pay us and have that value exchange. So we didn't introduce it immediately where it was you had to have a value exchange with us at that time, you had to pay us then. And instead, we warmed everybody up to that idea. So that by the time that they actually hit a firm paywall, they were completely aware that this was coming, right? Maybe they didn't love it, but it was coming and nobody was taken aback by that moment. And we tested the heck out of this and found a whole bunch of different things really mattered, both about the moment, but then also the way you phrase it. So the psychology of loss aversion was an incredibly important finding for us that if you, instead of asking people which devices did you want to keep as a two-device platform, we asked them which devices do you want to get rid of, people were much more likely, they hate the idea of getting rid of devices that they would have access to. It's just like when you're gambling in a casino, people are willing to keep betting, right, in order to try to win back what they've lost at this point. The second thing we discovered was there's no way we're going to do this with email alone. With 600 million hours of time that people spend in our app, that's a more media than probably a whole bunch of different companies could even buy when you think about Super Bowl ad type time. And it's contextually relevant because I know what's going on with you at that moment. So we actually went about building a communication channel into our product so that we can reach our users with those messages at exactly that right time based on the behaviors they're taking. Because we have to create moments as marketers now. It's not going to come just by the seasonal clock and, and the holiday schedule and so forth. Instead, it's going to be determined by what that user is doing. And no two users are ever doing the same thing at the same time, is what I learn every time. 
email has proven to be powerful and the lowest common denominator, a blunt instrument for reaching people, right? Because if you have two thirds of your, uh, your population opted in, a one third open rate, and then a 2% click through rate, you need to send like a million emails to get 2,000 clicks. Well, that's a lot of email out there. Versus when you talk to people in the product, there, isn't, there aren't those same sorts of constraints. So on the channel, so my takeaway on the channel thing is think through how you can create your own channels. Channels that may not have existed before because the traditional means that are out there are probably not gonna be as effective. And then the last thing that we learned was the right message may not be about the words at all, but instead the offer that you make somebody. So if you just really simply think through your customer base on two of the most simple segmentations you could do. Are they paying you or are they not paying you? And are they sensitive about paying you or are they insensitive about paying you, right? We have a very affluent install base, so we could think about them in these terms. Well, if you're in the top left quadrant where you're already paying us and you're price insensitive, meaning that you're incredibly inelastic, that's a great chance for us to talk about, are you paying us the right amount of money? Would you be willing to pay us more for the things that are out there, people who live an Evernote way of life? People on the top right where they're not paying us, but they're still price insensitive, will always tell you, you have to give them a reason to pay you, and that's where the paywall actually comes in. Because most SaaS companies find out that their installed base is inelastic, and yet the greatest hurdle to getting somebody to convert to paying them is price. So if you can't figure out ways to price discriminate so that you make different offers to those populations based on what they want, it's gonna be really hard to use a single offer to get all of the people who should be paying you. On the bottom right then, is the price sensitive group who still aren't paying you at this point. And I think a lot of times people confuse the idea of price with just what your headline price is, what you charge. When in reality, price is what's included and it's all the promotions and the discounts and the time over which you charge something, right? So we found out that you can use a series of discounts in order to create a clear relationship between your offers that guides people to always take one, right? As marketers, we always know that if you have three offers, people take the middle one. But how do you make the middle one dominant by the more expensive one so that no one should ever choose that? Well, you can use promotions to basically create introductory pricing, right? And then on the bottom side of things is that price sensitive group who are paying you, that you can think about as, hey, this is somebody that we can offer a lower price skew to who may not have taken the higher price that we were, that we were there. If you put all of those pieces together with that exact right moment and the right way of reaching them inside of the product. That was where we were able to take our daily bookings from where they were and essentially double them and continue on that path of growth now up until the future. This is sort of just the first 60 days of what happened. I think this is, uh, we call this Project Gnome because if anybody ever knows the, uh, the South Park reference to the gnomes who are trying to build a business around collecting underpants, that's what we were at times uh, questioned if we were trying to do. I tell you all this because it may sound like this is a super consumery type of approach to marketing, but I actually don't think it is just relevant for what we're trying to do in the consumer SaaS business. At this point, everything is becoming a service, right? We talk about BYOB of what we all did in college of like, okay, bring your own beer, right? And that was fun, but then all of a sudden, bring your own device emerged 10 years ago when the iPhone came out. And now every IT director didn't want to be in charge of managing $500 devices for everyone, yet every end user said, there's no way I'm carrying this BlackBerry and this iPhone at the same time. So we're going to find a way through this. And now that's evolved into this moment of bring your own tools, your own apps to work as well. And we're starting to see that pattern emerge with Slack and with Dropbox, where the end user is in much more powerful position than an IT decision maker to choose how we go about picking the tools that we experience, that, we, that we'll use for work. Gartner says that by 2020, more than 90% of the software spend will be outside of the CIO's budget. It's not a great time to be a CIO, but it's an awesome time to be an end user or a knowledge worker inside of that world. So how is it that we can use this sort of creatively analytic approach to think about this in terms of even how we ended up as Telium customers? It wasn't through like a massive RFP. We, we actually, we hired a, an agency to advise us and didn't like their answer, and so we went out and just played with every tool that we could that was out there to find out what it was that we were gonna use. And I can tell you with confidence that end user influence is only going to grow, and you're going to have to find ways that you reach out to them. 
So LogMeIn has done a ton of research about how powerful Bring Your Own App has become. And two thirds of organizations are already experiencing this phenomenon where there are tools behind the firewall that IT will never know about. When you ask those guys, what is it, how big is this problem for you? The IT directors estimate that about 2.7 apps are behind their firewall at this point. In reality, it's like 21. They're off by like an order of magnitude. So how is it that we can apply some of the principles that we're learning from this consumer experience to dispel the myth that B2B and B2C will exist in five or 10 years? Because it's not like I became a new human being the day I walked into Evernote and started using Evernote for business. I was still just the same guy who'd used Evernote like that forever. We saw that for all the times in our, um, in our installed base, that more than 70% of our users use Evernote in, the, in, the, uh, in a business environment. So I'd encourage you to take away from this the questions of, how could you be a little bit more creatively analytic? What is that data that resides with you that maybe Telium can help you unlock, right? And there are three things that you can immediately do. Hopefully this is not a 10-year journey for you the way it has been for me. The first one is, you can't analyze what you don't track. Instrument everything, whether it's your product or your website or the marketing that you do, so that there's never a question of what's going on. You never know what piece of data might actually turn out to be the linchpin for figuring out what is next and what the decision is that you should make. The second thing is, develop this culture where analytics isn't what you do after you do marketing to find out how you did. Analytics is part of everything that you do, from the, fr from the beginning uh, of any campaign to the times where you're course correcting and, and tuning and testing, all the way to that last moment where you're trying to answer for your board what's the, the ROI on all of the marketing dollars that you spent. And then finally is, uh, we have this expression at Evernote of don't wait to go to Mars. You're never going to have the perfect plan, and you're never going to know until you get started. The sooner you start, the sooner you're going to learn, and the sooner your data is going to get better and better, and you're going to be able to take more advantage of that. I think this is a really exciting time for marketing. It's, maybe it's more exciting for me because the truth is I didn't start in marketing. I was an investor for a long time, and now here I am wondering about the power of all of this data that we could use to help people be more successful at Evernote, to help marketers be more, more successful. So I, kind of, I invite you to join this movement if you think anything about what I've said then think about how it is that you can build messages out of numbers, how it is that you can turn arithmetic into words. This is what I call being creatively analytic, spelled out with just numbers. Thanks very much for all your time. I'd love to answer any questions.